Hey everybody, welcome to a very, very special episode of the Dune Steve. Well, it can't be that special, we've got three of them. Oh yes, in this episode, Rish Outfield learns about sexual reproduction. It's about bloody time. What other things do they do in special episodes sometimes? Arnold learns about drugs and their consequences. In this episode, Dudley is molested by the bicycle shop owner. And Rish Outfield is beaten to death by a roving gang. Next week on a very special episode of Blossom. Okay, you, you've got the idea, announcement nice. This is kind of like that, except for a little different. This is the, what are we calling it? The Lost Episode Trilogy? Oh, I like that. Oh, we, we should make up a song for the Lost Episode Trilogy. They went away. Oh, boy, let's not. We no, found no. them once again. Three lonely episodes of the Dune Steef, my friend. Sing another note, and I walk. Okay, well, I, I think if we practiced it a little bit, it might sound good. Maybe. Maybe. Now it sounds kind of like an Eddie Money song, so we'll have to see. If, if I could walk on oh, water, boy, we'll have to see if I we can do something about that. I would have three of Lost Dune Steve episodes. It would get me laid in the back seat of my Pinto. But they don't have back seats, do they? Just one of those little hatch things. Are, are we doing a story today or what? Okay, this is the first of three super duper... Well, long lost episodes are ones that we've had floating around for a long time. A long time. For one reason or another, we've been unable to get them out. And now here they are, presented for your pleasure, one after the other after the other. And hey, I'll see if I can get Big to sing with me next week. Yeah, you'll see about that. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Monster, you. You dirty little monster. Rish Outfield. You're a bad man. You're a very bad man. And I am an outer man. Wish it into the cornfield. Please, son, wish it into the cornfield, please. You die, mate. Good day, y'all. Uh, this is Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 95. Wow, we're getting up there. We're nearing uh, our 100th episode. Yeah, how about that? Uh, uh, just between you and me. Robot, you can cut this part out. Are we going to do something special for the 100th episode? I was thinking we could play um, that Rochambeau game again that we did that one episode. Do you remember that? I don't. No. But that's a game where somebody can send in the right answers and they win something. They win a t-shirt. No, no. It's like Rochambeau. You know, kind of like chicken, I think. Chicken is where you're driving towards somebody right, and the first and one to swerve. Right. You see Kind of like that. You, you see who can last the longest. I don't know if you remember. We, we did this one time before where you just have the contest to see who's the toughest. And so you... You have to kick each other in the nuts until somebody gives. I, I, I do remember that. <laughs> uh, I, I believe I won that contest. I think you did. You proved to be quite tough, Rish. Really impressive. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. On with the countdown. Lucky. The lead singer of the cars is a ghastly looking <laughs> So what story we got today, Rish? You know, I, I don't want to jinx it, so I don't dare say the name, <laughs> but I believe our good friend, our good friend, I believe our good acquaint, I believe a total stranger, Rick Kennett, has written this story, <laughs> Out of the Storm. Out of the Storm by Rick Kennett on the countdown coming up next. That's right. It's hard to believe that it could be possible, and maybe we're still jinxing it, because as we record this, you know, it's not done. So this could be complete problems to say this at all, but it's out of the storm. It's finally here. What 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 do you think? What's your? Uh, let, let me give you. A, we place some some money on this. We no, can wager. no Rochambeauing. I'm what, sorry. <laughs> what's Unless your, I get to go first. What's your over under? Do you think it, it came in before or after February 2010? It was submitted before or after? I lost so much money on the Super Bowl, <laughs> but I'm I'm I'm. Going to bet one more time before February. Wait, was there a date in February? 
Before February 1st, is that what you're saying? We'll say February 1st. Yes, before, before, before February 1st. Okay, you won that bet. Now let's take this further. Okay. Before or after January 1st, 2010? Uh, I would say it was a 2009 story. Okay, before or after October 2009? Okay, there I'm going to say after. Oh, you were doing so well. It was submitted September 20th, 2009. <laughs> Oh, geez, what are we, Starship Sofa? I can't believe that. Oh, wait, wait let's just play you know, the story. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to play the story because we've kind of, we're, we're eating into our post-story boundary here by doing this before the story. So, we'd like to thank Marshall Latham for putting this story together for us. He is our producer for today's episode. You know, we're so glad to have Marshall around. He, he really jumped in, you know, feet first and has really... Come on, Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. That's all I ever hear on this oh, show. Yeah, I suppose we do say that a lot, don't we? <laughs> it has replaced the uh, dragging poor Marcus into all of this <laughs> as, as our oft-repeated... I think so. Well, tell us a little bit about the author, sir. All right. But at the risk of sounding like a broken record, we have had this guy on before, of course. Rick Kennett is still living in Melbourne. I mean, Melbourne. Ah. And is still working as the world's longest serving motorcycle courier. I bet you didn't know that. No, I, I didn't. I didn't know he was the but, longest. <clears throat> but to set off his... Gray little existence. He has recently become involved with the production of a feature film of one of his Ernie Pine Ghost Hunter stories. Really? Wow. Yeah. The script has been written and interest generated in a couple of places within the Australian film industry. Rick hopes to appear in a cameo scene. Hopefully it will be better than that crappy cameo scene that Stephanie Meyer had in that <laughs> stupid Twilight movie. Sorry. It'll be set in the public library as cameo scene where he's sitting in the background reading a book that the film's original story appeared in. Huh? That'll be a cool cameo. Can you write in your own cameo like that? I mean, of course, I've well, done he's, it. <laughs> he's working with the folks that are making the films. Yeah, you have to find out more about it. Information's going to go on to uh, Rick Kennett's website as the uh, project progresses, so check it out. We've got links to his website on the show notes. In the show we They're in them. The okay. show notes, not on them. That's kind of weird. It's all right. Do you mind if we call you, Bruce? Keep it straight. This story originally appeared in the trade paperback Terror Australis. Wait, wait. What paperback? Terror Australis. I'm, I'm sorry. One, one more time? Terror Australis. Ah. The best of Australian aura. <laughs> Australia, Australia, Australia. Australia we, we love, love you. you. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> Out of the Storm by Rick Kennett The destroyer found her in the middle of the Indian Ocean, drifting bows down from out of a storm that had killed three other ships. Binoculars trained on her from the warship's bridge, and they saw she was HMAS Beringi, a minesweeper corvette missing nearly a week. The destroyer sounded her siren, fired a blank shot. No response. Beringi, silent, dead, rolled to the troughs and crests, her bows lifting sluggishly, dipping deep. The ropes from the empty lifeboat davits trailed in the water. The canvas flap of the door to her bridge slapped against the woodwork. With her guns swinging through their arcs, the destroyer circled. Then came a beam. Those on the bridge and lining her decks saw the ugly black gash behind the four-inch gun on the foredeck of the little ship. Grapples were thrown, clanking, catching and Beringi was boarded. The first man to hit her deck clambered downhill, forward to where the bomb or shell had struck behind the gun. What remained of the gun's crew was already black and drying, draped over the splinters of the deck and merging into the blast mark across the front of the bridge superstructure. At the bottom of the hole, not far below, oily water oozed around twists of jagged metal, and in odd, quiet moments, something down there made soft bumping noises. The others who boarded climbed upward to the tilted quarterdeck or down deep into the engine and boiler rooms, over hatch combings and into echoing steel alleyways, finding no one. The wireless office, cruise space, lobbies, lockers, messes, wash places, small arms magazine, officers' quarters were all deserted. 
The hatch leading to the bosun's store forward was shut and dogged watertight. The leader of the boarding party, Lieutenant Dixon, stood beside it. He said, What's it sound like? The seamen there had already pressed their ears against the steel, hearing only their own blood and breathing. Someone thought there was a faraway tap-tap behind the silence behind the hatch. But none of this was said to Lieutenant Dixon, whose beard and close-set eyes seemed to fix his expression with a permanent what-did-you-call-me look, regardless of the occasion. A leading seaman cautiously said, Sounds dry behind it, sir. He stood aside. Dixon bent to the hatch and listened. What about the seams and rivets in this bulkhead? Dry, sir. Bone dry. Hmm. He heard nothing that sounded like the sea sloshing around in there, though there was perhaps a rhythmic tap-tap somewhere in the muffled distance. Everybody get back to the last compartment and close the hatch behind you. Not being heroes or fools, the seamen did as they were told. Not being a hero or a fool himself, merely the officer in charge of the boarding party, Dixon eased off the hatch's bottom dog iron. He gripped the locking wheel central of the hatch and jerked it counterclockwise, then kicked against the steel just above the combing. No sudden wetness glistened on the bottom edge, so he eased off the remaining dog iron and inched the hatch open. An electric voice crackled across the water. What's it look like, number one? Lacking even a loud hailer to reply, Lieutenant Dixon had to shout through cupped hands to his captain as the destroyer steamed slowly down Beringi's port side. Complete derelict, sir. Boil is stone cold. Engineer says about eight hours for a head of steam. All dry after the gyro compass room bulkhead. It's buckled and it's been shored up pretty rough. I'm having it redone. He hesitated, glancing at the front of the bridge superstructure. A steam hose would be appreciated, sir. Understandable. The figure holding the microphone on the destroyer's bridge nodded, turned, and spoke to others. The warship's engine room telegraphs clanged flat notes on the still sea air, and she slipped away from Beringi at increased speed to circle with Asdick pinging the depths. It was unhealthy not to keep moving in these waters. Dixon watched her glide away, all too aware of his sitting duck status. Except for the four-inch gun, which was smashed to uselessness, Beringi's only weapon was a 40 millimeter Bofors anti-aircraft gun on the boat deck aft. That and two 20 millimeter machine guns mounted one either bridge wing. The four-inch, he decided, could be... He jerked about, startled by a sudden hollow hammering inside the dead ship. He relaxed. It was the damage control party reshoring the gyro compass room bulkhead. He returned his attention to the four-inch gun, sitting askew and jammed on its mounting, its breech block shattered by the blast that had shattered its gunners. It would have to be cut up and ditched, which would help bring up her bows. They'd need that extra freeboard if Beringi was to be steamed back. He tried not admitting it to himself, but he was unhappy in the knowledge that if they did get her underway, he would have to captain her. He'd often dreamt of a command of his own, but this was a nightmare he'd not counted on. Down below... The hammering abruptly stopped. For a second, Dixon thought the hatch had given way, and recognized in the thought an actual wish. But there was no crash, no shouts, no gush of inrushing sea. A moment more, and the hammering started again. He looked out over the near-sunken bows. Luck was with them. The sea was calming. For what it was worth, someone said a prayer before the steam hose was turned on. The job was done hastily without further ceremony. Their captain was not one to be wanting his destroyer stopped with a hose pipe draped over the side for any longer than the grisly work needed. Neither radar nor Asdick were returning echoes, but the sea was now unusually flat and the sky clear. They were the perfect targets. In the captain's cabin aboard Beringi, Lieutenant Dixon sat himself down at the desk to sort out the situation. In front of him lay a framed photograph face down. He picked it up. It showed two naval men dressed in the tropical kit of short-sleeved shirts and shorts. One was a lieutenant commander of average height and build, and who looked about forty despite his boyish curly hair. The other man was younger, a lieutenant, rather lanky with a thin face and fair receding hair. With a shock, 
Dixon realized he knew this man, had trained with him at a shore station before the war. For the life of him, however, he could not remember the man's name. Nevertheless, the photograph was a horrible coincidence in black and white. He dropped the photo back face down, wishing he'd never picked it up. He returned his attention to the boarding party's reports. There were fuel oil estimates, fresh water reserves, provisions, ammunition. There were the general reports about the condition of the ship as found. Boiler room safety valve wide open. Primer pins pulled from the depth charges on the quarterdeck. An abandoned ship procedure so they don't explode as the ship goes under. All life jackets gone. Sextant and logbook gone. Code and recognition signal books gone. Probably dumped. Another abandoned ship procedure. In fact, everything pointed to the orderly evacuation of a sinking ship. And then, Beringi didn't sink. A few minutes ago, someone had noticed that both anchors were missing, and with them, fathoms of chain, tons of weight, which, Dixon told himself, might partly explain Beringi's miraculous survival. But without engine power and a hand on her helm, he knew the little corvette should have broached two on the first storm wave and been rolled under. Strange. There was a knock on the cabin door. Come, said Dixon. He was expecting the engineer with a report on the pumps. No one entered. Yes, come in. Nothing happened. Damnation! Dixon stepped to the door and wrenched it open. In the lobby outside stood the lanky, thin-faced man of the photograph. The figure was shrouded in black, a cloak of darkness that made the thin, bloodless face seem to glow. The apparition wavered to and fro like so much tossing flotsam. Then it suddenly swelled toward Dixon, bringing with it a cold dampness until its face pressed close into his. Leave! Dixon stumbled back, hit the chair, and fell. He was on his feet again in an instant. But there was nothing now in the doorway. Feeling strange and shaky, he peered into the lobby. It was empty. He ran up the companionway to the bridge and looked wildly left and right. Who came through just then? The seaman, sweeping up smashed glass, fixed the officer with a stare of surprise. Beg your pardon, sir? Don't come the innocence with me, Tyler. Dixon snapped, slightly shrill. I'll have you on report. Sir, no one's been through that door. Not since yourself, sir, five minutes ago. The lieutenant glared at him as if daring him to betray the lie. Then he turned and banged shut the door. The captain's cabin was still empty when he returned. Nothing waiting, wavering, dark. But the lobby, an enclosed space between cabins, was cold and smelt unnaturally damp. The circling destroyer had given those aboard Beringi a sense of security, something they needed as the afternoon brought more blue skies and flat seas. The weather had made them nervous, and noticeably the most nervous of all was Lieutenant Dixon, who had suddenly developed the habit of glancing over his shoulder at nothing at all. Except for some pumping, which had had no effect on the ship's bows-down attitude, work was proceeding well. The anchor chain winch had been unbolted and was about to be manhandled over the side. Oxy cutting gear had been ferried over by motorboat, and demolition of the smashed four-inch was well advanced. A tarpaulin had been stretched over the punched-in deck. Steam pressure's building up satisfactorily, said the engineer above the hiss of the cutting torch. He paused a moment, wiping his hands down his overalls before adding, Got the dynamo running now. There's power in the ship. Lieutenant Dixon acknowledged this with a stiff nod. How's that bulkhead? Will it take the strain once we get underway? It should, if you don't take it too quick. Four or five knots should be all right. There's no leaks and the new shore ring's holding up. But there's something knocking against that bulkhead. Just every now and then a series of taps in the flooded compartments. What do you think it is? I wouldn't like to say. Neither would I, Dixon replied, imagining. He glanced behind him. Nothing was there. Bloody strange, the ship, don't you think? The way she survived that storm with this sort of damage and no crew... The way everything points to the abandonment of a sinking ship, and then the ship doesn't sink. Bloody strange. I wouldn't have expected a ship damaged like this to survive that storm, no. The engineer had wondered about that, of course. Though right now he was wondering why the first lieutenant was talking as if accusing the ship of something like deception. 
Just lucky, I suppose. Lucky, said Dixon to himself. Then to the engineer. As soon as they're finished with the anchor winch, detail a couple of hands to dump those depth charges. Without their primer pins, they're just so much amatol waiting on the quarter deck for the first stray bullet. We won't be lucky forever. At that moment, the winch went over the side with a mighty splash and a cheer. The bows came up, though not by much. Half an hour later, they came up more, in a series of little jerks as the four-inch gun went over in four or five large, slag-edged pieces. This also put the rudder and screws deeper into the water, at the same time bringing into view a jagged hole blown out on the port bow. Some oil oozed, some flotsam drifted out. They waited and watched, but nothing more emerged. Only later... When there was steam pressure and the engineer had intoned the formula, Ready to proceed, sir. Did anyone notice the ship's clocks? On the bridge, in the officer's quarters and captain's cabin, in the engine room, boiler room, and ward room, all these eight-day pieces had stopped at precisely six minutes past six, and no amount of winding, tinkering, or swearing would make them work. Just on sunset, Beringi turned to the southeast to begin a five-knot waddle to Geraldton, a small port on the western Australia coast, and at 300 miles the closest harbor. Three to four days were estimated for the voyage, weather permitting. And if things got too rough, there was always the destroyer's motorboat slung in Beringi's portside davits. Bitch to steer, said Tyler, struggling with the wheel. The comment was uncalled for, despite its truth, though Lieutenant Dixon said nothing. He stepped out onto the port bridge wing to watch the destroyer, cut black against the afterglow, racing into the west on her search for Beringi's crew. Night closed in over the little ship as she plodded on with only a brilliance of stars to light her way and magnetic compasses to guide her. The wind keening through the empty window frames sounded sometimes like lost voices and sometimes like a woman's crying, but hardly ever like the wind. It blew cold against the men at the engine room telegraphs, the quartermaster wrestling the wheel, the young signalman standing at the back of the bridge in the dark. Just before the ten o'clock change of watch, Dixon went out again onto the bridge wing, where the wind was honest from the sea and sounded that way. The foredeck below looked a large triangle of shadow, flat save for where wind rippled the tarpaulin. All he could see of the bows was that moment of white water as they nudged waves aside. He looked astern, past the single squat funnel, past their motorboat in the davits, past the mine-sweeping derricks on the quarterdeck to the wake. At five knots, Beringi was hardly churning up the water, making the wake hard to see, making it difficult to determine any dog-legging. What he could see of it seemed straight enough. Yet the more he looked, the more he thought there was something wrong back there, some indefinite shape trailing in the wake. Callahan! The young signalman came scuttling up out of the dark. Sir? Lay aft. See if we're dragging something astern. Aye, aye, sir. The youth slid down the ladder to the main deck. Dixon ducked back onto the bridge. What's the helm feel like, Tyler? Heavy handling, sir. That's nothing unusual. Dixon grunted, stepped to the opposite bridge wing and looked aft. He thought he saw Callahan at the stern rails, standing beneath the derrick booms which were crossed over each other like the resting hands of the dead. But it was hard to tell what was what back there among the paravanes, derricks, cables, and winches. Besides, it was dark. Was that thing still in the wake? It was hard to tell. Callahan! No one answered. Nothing moved on the quarterdeck. Then he thought he saw a face appear briefly around the funnel. One of those manning the Bofors gun? He wasn't sure. He wondered about the face, and wondered why he wasn't certain who it had been. But who else could it have been? And where the hell was Callahan? Callahan! Again, nothing happened while he waited half a minute. Dixon put his head around the bridge flap. Stop both. No, belay that. He turned again as the bridge ladder rattled. Young Callahan came up slowly, hesitant, looking confused. It was this about him which made Dixon hold back from upbraiding him, so that instead he asked with a sense of foreboding, What did you see? Callahan shuffled his feet 
and was unable to meet the officer's eyes as he said, There's... there's nothing back there, sir. Dixon peered aft. The water did appear empty now, yet he was sure he'd glimpsed something. All right, get to the galley and fetch us up some cocoa. Dixon watched Callahan descend the ladder again, not so sprightly this time. Another long look aft showed nothing. He shrugged and wondered why Callahan had lied. Fifteen minutes before sunrise, Beringi went to dawn action stations. Her three guns swung through their arcs, waiting. But the sun came up in a clear sky over a smooth sea to show an unbroken horizon. The ship's clocks took no notice of time as watch followed watch throughout the day. It was six minutes past six aboard Beringi, and that was that. A story was getting around that somebody had altered one of the clocks, tired of seeing its hands standing always in the same positions. Yet later, it was found showing again six past six. Late that afternoon, a seaplane droned out of the north on an apparent interception course. Those who had them raised long barreled binoculars to see the red ball insignia on the wings and fuselage. The plane came on at a steady speed, too high for their guns, closing until even those without binoculars could see the pontoons beneath its wings. A seaplane this far out could only mean a cruiser somewhere close by. Ten thousand tons of brutal steel, which might come prowling over the horizon at any moment. Stop both! ordered Dixon. The engine room's telegraphs rang. Beringi lost way and stopped, small and quiet, showing no wake now. The plane's shadow flickered over the ship. He must be blind, someone whispered on the bridge. But the plane droned over them, and five minutes later was a fading speck in the south. I'm taking out a ticket in tats when we get back, said one of the telegraph men, and, on orders from the lieutenant, pushed his lever forward again to slow ahead. Dixon sat down on the captain's stool at the back of the bridge as a wind picked up through the windows. Just lucky, I suppose. He recalled the engineer's words of the previous day. Strange sort of luck, he went on thinking. To survive a storm and lose a crew. He couldn't help but think the word unnatural better described Beringi's luck, and wondered what it was exactly he meant by it. Thoughts linked to thoughts, leading his mind unwillingly back to that wavering, dark thing in the lobby. Leave. He'd been unable to deny to himself the reality of the figure, as he wished he could, while at the same time unable to comprehend that reality. Leave. Why leave? Beringi had proved a lucky ship so far for himself and his men, if not for her original crew. Lucky, he said softly. Beg your pardon, sir? Dixon almost jumped, but it was only Chief Boson's mate, Frude, the buffer, standing beside him in the gathering shadows and doing his job as the officer, an ad hoc officer, of this particular watch. Lucky, repeated Dixon. About the plane, yes, sir. About everything, buffer. The plane, calm seas, lack of enemy attention. The way she survived that storm, damaged like she is, with no crew. Yes, sir. Lucky. The way he said it seemed to add, but not for her crew. And Dixon was about to ask him if he didn't think it an unnatural sort of luck when he decided not to. It would have been an odd question, especially coming from an officer and in front of other ratings. Besides... He wasn't really sure what it was he was getting at, so he said, Get the chart and I'll check our course. Looks like we're in for another starry night. With that, the subject of luck and lucky ships was closed, and with it any chance of talk straying close to dark things in lobbies. After sunset, Lieutenant Dixon took his sextant sightings on the starry sky he'd predicted and found Beringi's position. Leaving the buffer in charge, he retired to the Asdick cabinet to sleep the few hours until ten, when his watch would begin. The Asdick cabinet 
Normally the noisy heart of anti-submarine activity was a quiet, still cubbyhole at the back of the bridge. The Aztec sat itself, sat screwed to the bulkhead, its valve innards shock smashed to uselessness, its earphones hanging mute upon a hook. The oscillating quartz crystal, the actual ping machinery, lay drowned in the flooded forward compartments. Dixon sat in the operator's chair and slept. Sometime later he awoke, or half awoke, to the distant voices of a man and a woman, fighting voices, thin telephone voices with no distinct words, but full of blame, anger, and fear. The woman sounded a hard bitch, iron hard, and the man sounded dangerously close to violence. As Dixon opened his eyes, the voices faded away, and in fading sped up like an old gramophone wound too tight too long. To Dixon, the silence seemed worse than the voices because it was the silence of a dead ship creeping across the ocean when she should be naturally in her grave three miles down. The bizarre fancy collided with his hope that the past few seconds, with their inexplicable sounds, had been a dream, just a dream. For a moment, he thought the ship was dead and at the bottom of the sea and that this thing carrying him back to safety and land was a ghost the last mad wish of dead men in two storm-lost boats. He banged his feet down on the deck. He was satisfied. Beringi was no ghost. She was real, iron real, iron hard under his feet. Yet with his acceptance of the reality of the ship came the whispering memory of a darkness-shrouded thing. It was a memory, he knew, that would be with him always, locked away in a brain cell marked Do Not Disturb. It would do the disturbing, slipping out in the quiet moments, or in his sleep, to push up against his face and whisper, Leave! He wished he could leave. He wished he could pull the plug on this ugly little scow and... First Lieutenant, sir. 2200, sir, said Frude in the cabinet doorway. Very good, Buffer. Thank you. Through the broken windows of the bridge, the stars shone bright and sharp. The sea was flat like a tabletop. No enemy shouldered over the horizon in the night, nor during the next day. As though the war was somebody else's problem, a million miles away, Beringi steamed along at her five-knot waddle, and the fine weather went on and on. What did you really see back there? Lieutenant Dixon asked young Callahan in the quiet of the bridge wing. The signalman blushed. He was not a liar, not really, and Dixon knew it. I saw a boat, he answered simply. For better or worse, Dixon let it go at that. During the mid-watch of the following day, with the buffer on the bridge, Dixon climbed down to inspect the bulkhead of the gyro compass room again. The wooden shoring, braced and wedged against the buckled plating, was still holding, and all seams were dry. Nevertheless, the bosun's store hatch had been secured behind him. The engineer had told him that the simple sit-down job of listening outside the bosun's store was unpopular with the man. Dixon didn't have to ask why. He knew. He knew as he stood in that last dry forward compartment and listened alone to the oddly timed tap-tap inside the flooded spaces. He knew as he returned to the bosun's store hatch with the rhythm still with him, He knew as he stepped over the combing and glanced back over his shoulder before slamming the hatch back into place. And in the crow's nest, far above, the lookout rang down to the bridge, saying, Must stead astern! The action alarm had been ringing several seconds when Dixon hit the upper deck. Men were running, shrugging on life jackets, tying the chin straps of tin hats. The barrel of the Bofors angled upward. The bridge wing machine guns were cocked and readied. Sailors took up sheltered positions with Tommy guns in their sweaty hands. Above the ringing of the alarm bell, somebody shouted from the boat deck, Ship coming up astern, sir! Dixon spared only a quick look behind him, glimpsing the smoke smudge of something far away coming up at a rate of knots. He spun and made for the bridge, thinking how bloody silly they all looked with what was approaching. And how brave. As he hit the rungs of the ladder, he yelled, Shut that bloody bell up! With a nervous vehemence that surprised him. 
The alarm cut off as the buffer pushed binoculars into his hands. Looks like a destroyer, sir. Even as he focused, Dixon was weighing up the chances of it being Japanese. Too near the coast. Too far south. Seen bows on it with smoke and bow wave and precious little definite in between. Signalman Callahan had the only other pair of binoculars on the bridge. He said, reading a stuttering light from the distant vessel. Message from the captain, sir. Don't shoot, don't shoot. It's us. He lowered the glasses, and with an inexcusable breach of discipline, began to laugh aloud. (laughs) Nothing had been found of Beringi's crew or boats after a 36-hour search in screeching winds and crazy cross seas. Damn queer, said the captain when Dixon told him of their continuing miracle of good weather. We were battling heavy seas all the way back. Only struck calm water again half an hour before we sighted you. They made port the next day. When Beringi was dry docked and pumped out, a body was exhumed from the forward compartments. Lieutenant Dixon was not surprised to hear that it was the body of his lanky, thin face acquaintance from training. He didn't ask if it had been found grasping a hammer or some such. He didn't want to know. In fact, he didn't want to know anything more about Beringi. Glad he was to be shot of her. Yet it was as if the ugly little ship held him in some horrible fascination, because he soon found himself following her fortunes, sometimes through official reports and signals, sometimes through wardroom talk with visiting officers from other ships. From these sources, Dixon pieced together a picture of a vessel possessed of extraordinary luck, and regarded with a vague uneasiness by all who served in her. There was the story of the submarine torpedo, which ran beneath Beringi and hit the coastal freighter she'd been escorting. There was the story of the crewman who was constantly taking photographs of Beringi's wake. There was the story of the refitting dock gang who refused to work aboard Beringi after dark. There was the story of the native islanders who, when Beringi anchored in their bay, were reluctant to paddle out to sell their fresh fruit, the way they did with other visiting warships. She sings and weeps much sad, they said. Despite the odds and hazards, Beringi steamed through the war, convoying, sweeping, patrolling in some of the most dangerous forward areas, always returning untouched by the enemy, while others around her died. On a cold, rainy day in 1961... Captain Dixon, now retired, saw Beringi for the last time. She was partly dismantled and tethered to a boy in a harbor backwater, waiting to be towed to the breaker's yard. Dixon stood on the shore beneath the trees and looked at her a long time. Her mast was gone, as was the searchlight platform, the anti-aircraft guns, the depth charge throwers, the clutter of gear on the quarterdeck. Many of the bridge windows were broken, setting him to wonder on what her interior looked like now. And what were those men doing assembling on her foredeck? Some of them, half-naked, looked like seamen, and some of them wore officers' caps, and all of them were transparent. In front of them, by the cable winch, stood the lanky, thin-faced lieutenant dressed in tropical kit. He was glaring forward with his hands clenched to fists at his sides. The rain increased a moment, misting the ship from view. When he could see her again, Dixon also looked towards the bows, The woman was ugly, very ugly, a hag with scraggly, stringy hair, hands like vulture claws, a face in profile which made Dixon glad he could not see it at close quarters. Her single gray covering was ragged and spotted with red. She stood at the very stem, braced against the jackstaff, staring back at the men like a cornered animal. And though there was nothing Dixon could hear, save for the beat of the rain in the water, he could see she was screaming screaming like the damned. Author's Note Out of the Storm is essentially a deal with the devil tale. There's been many stories about ships with souls, such as Nicholas Montserrat's The Ship That Died of Shame, which was made into a movie in 1955 starring Sir Richard Attenborough. If a ship can have a soul... Why can't she sell that soul? No, it's not a rhetorical question. Ask. Beringi did this for protection from the storm. 
She betrayed her crew. This is the reason for the fight Dixon hears between the man and the woman in his dream. At the end, the hag, the ship's soul, is cornered by the ghosts of the crew as the ship is taken away for scrap. Screaming like the damned is literally what she's doing, because that's what she is. Damned. Her deal allowed her to be such a lucky ship for the rest of the war, this is why the Japanese plane that flew right over her never saw her. The ghost of Dixon's friend told him to leave, because if Beringi was left to sink, the dead could rest, which they can't do until the death of the ship. The name Beringi has no meaning. It's just a word I made up that sounds vaguely aboriginal. Sixty of these minesweeper corvettes were built by the Australian Navy during the war. I worked in the engine room of one, HMAS Castle Maine, in the early 80s when she was a museum ship. So I can talk about this kind of vessel with a little bit of authority. All right, everybody, we're back. She's a good Sheila, now Tad stuck up. I mean. Okay, welcome back, folks. Now, on to the cast list. Yes, that's a new feature here. Cast list. Yeah, nobody spoke up last week, so uh, we're going to do it again. Yep. Silence implies consent, ladies. Yes, you are forced to listen to it. So, this week's story was produced by Marshall Latham. Thanks again for producing the story, Marshall. Great job with that. Excellent work, sir. Rich Outfield was our narrator, and he was also the voice of the captain. And an unknown seaman <coughs> who says... <coughs> Continue. <clears throat> he says, must be blind when the plane goes by, if you recall. Big Anklevich was the ghost voice and the voice of the dream man. I'm your dream hey. maker! All right. And he was also the telegraph man. Cameron Horsburgh. Is it really Horsburgh? Yes. I've been saying Cameron Horsburgh all this time. Horsburgh. Okay. As if it were the place in town, that borough that you go to where all the horrors live. <laughs> I'm sure he will never work for us again. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. Cam Goodbye. Cameron Horsburgh played the voice of Lieutenant Dixon. Uh, what was his rank? Oh, sorry. Lieutenant Dixon, I should say. Thank you, sir. Simon Dooley was the voice of Seaman Tyler. <laughs> Patrick Dwyer was the engineer. Dylan Boyd was Signalman Callahan. Ben McLean was Frude the Buffa. And Julian Ramundi was the leading seaman <clears throat> and the lookout. Thanks, everybody, for participating in our little play. Yes, a bunch of fine Sheilas and not at all stuck up. <laughs> I believe I'm using that slang correctly. Uh, you know, the weird thing was, we went through that whole cast list, and not a person on there was named Bruce. What the heck? Oh, Something must have happened in Australia. These must all be children of Bruce's. Yeah, that must be it. But uh, yeah, the, the Australian, we don't really talk about it because we didn't want to draw attention to horrendous Australian accents. But hey, the other day I saw... What was the movie that won Best Picture? King's Speech. I, I saw the King's Speech, and Jeffrey Rush plays an Australian in that. Uh huh. And so you get lines of dialogue, very extraordinarily Australian lines like, No, sir, I classically trained, and, and today I will be performing the part of Laertes. And everybody goes, Oh, get back to that colony, a prisoner you go down there, and all that. Everywhere he goes, everybody treats him badly because he's Australian. Except for that he speaks like Jeffrey Rush always does, <laughs> which made me worry that I have no idea what an Australian actually sounds like. Well, I'm sure all the Australians that listened to this episode know quite well what the... Uh, it's not their show, though. They're I guess that's ones. true. They're not the ones that are going to be uh, putting to shame their lovely, huge country. There you go. The whole deal with this story is really interesting. We got the story, like I said, all the way back in September of 2009. So we're going on a year and a half here with this story. That's kind of horrifying to me. Yeah, it is. It's one of those things that we really get upset about when it happens. But we've produced Rick Kennett stories since 
picking that up. <laughs> That's true. So this one's just been on the back burner. It's, but he sent this one in to us before he sent in his October Scary Story, which we did almost a year ago now when we did the October Scary Story event. And that was the last Rick Kennett story That's we did? the last one we've done of his. But we also have another story of his coming up soon. Oh, can't we run that first? Just We may well do that. Who knows when this episode's actually going to come out. But yeah, the story came into us and I read it and I remember just, the, there was something about the story. The, the mood in this story is just really thick. It's really intense. You just feel creeped out the whole time. It, we've talked before about zomb the zombie apocalypse. And, and in, we shall again. Yes, that's right. Sorry. Um, too right, Rish. And we started again. And, you know, we've got nothing. <laughs> Just say the same three <laughs> lines over and over again. And we've mentioned that, you know, in the zombie apocalypse, you have that, you know that there's zombies out there. That constant threat. Yeah, there's that endless threat. And this one, you don't know what the threat is. But you just feel like there's something hovering. Something's right behind you the whole time. You look over your shoulder, maybe you'll see it. If you look fast enough, you might finally get a glimpse of whatever the heck it is that's right behind you. And that keeps turning with you as you turn in a circle. That's just what this story made me feel like the whole time. The plane flies over and doesn't see him. You just keep expecting some kind of doom, some disaster to be right there. And it's going to happen. And there's a ghost on the ship. And then it doesn't happen. And and then we get to the end. And, and then the, the, the hag is there screaming like the damned. And then and I was just like, God, I think I missed something. But I liked the story so much that I wanted to do it anyways. And so I finally had to say, hey, Rick, what's the deal with this story? I, 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 I must have missed something. I didn't get it. And so he told us about this whole deal with the devil thing. And then that, and that, and that the ship has a soul. The ship is a character it's alive it has a soul and it sold its soul to the devil and that's how it's managed to do all this stuff that it did and then if you go back and listen to it through you'll notice some interesting things uh in there and how you know lieutenant dixon <laughs> is freaked out by how lucky they seem to be boy this just sure, sure seems weird how lucky we are this didn't happen and that didn't happen and the other thing didn't happen yeah it definitely had Thick mood. You are. <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to say. Whoa. So let, let's just get it out of the way. Do you want to give a, a guess? I'll give you two guesses what I'm about okay. to say. Okay. Here, I'm going to tell you what you're about to say. Are you ready? Okay. It was only Chief Bosun's mate through the buffer. <laughs> In a roundabout way, that's what I was going to say. Jeez, there's no easy way to say it, so I will just say it. Of all the stories... Uh, in all the gin joints, she had to walk into mine. This was the most difficult read we've had <laughs> of all of the episodes ever. Partly because of the Australian. Partly because of Rick's writing style. But mostly because of the naval yes. speak. It was definitely the naval thing. There was a lot of difficult things to say. And... and we mentioned Lieutenant before. That was one of those things where Rick said, oh, by the way, guys, back in this time, the uh, Australian Navy still used to say Lieutenant instead of Lieutenant. And then, of course, we forgot. Or no, did we remember? Oh, that's what no, we did. No, uh, halfway through the story, yeah. we remember. <laughs> so we had to go back and find all the... <laughs> and, you know, to, if we were to do that today, we would just search and replace in the document. Right. Change Liu to Left. And our problems would be solved. Well, one problem would be solved. <laughs> the, the major headache, and I hope this doesn't sound like an insult. If, if anything, it's an insult to me, is I had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah, seriously. Uh, yeah. Dixon almost jumped. But it was only Chief Boson's mate, Frude, the buffer, standing beside him in the gathering shadows and doing his job as the officer, an ad hoc officer, of this particular watch. You know... Maybe that's not a good example, but I just remember really struggling that, with the fruit the buffer line. That fruit the buffer line. We read that and we went, "What the hell is fruit the buffer?" We didn't. We we thought maybe fruit was a naval term. We were sure if it was a character or what it was. Chief Boson's mate, fruit the buffer. It was just there were so many things that were like that. And if you listen to this week's outtakes, you will hear where we absolutely lose it when we get to that line. It was one of those deals where it, you can't stop laughing you know you get into that mode and yeah we could not uh, that's probably half of the uh 
one hour and eight minute reading was us trying to get ourselves back under control after we'd read the Frood the Buffer line. But yeah, of course, at some point, Frood's name comes up again. We realize this, that, that's the guy's name is Frood. Frood of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Gold. Sing it. Why does he have nine fingers? Where is the ring of doom? Sorry. Funny that announcer man doesn't complain when you sing. Well, the there's a reason for that. He's over there scratching himself. I don't know how to keep this guy around. <laughs> oh. Sing another note. And I walk. Okay, and so there it was. Just it was so ridiculously hard, and I didn't know what I was saying. But then it is difficult. I think we talked on Brian's podcast not too long ago. Brian Lincoln's podcast, the Full Cast podcast. We had an interview with him and Abby, and and they talked about you know they asked us for some things that we could give as advice to people who are narrating their own stories or are narrating stories for people and how they can improve their reading. And one of the things that I said was, make sure as you're reading that you know what you're saying. It's easy to just see words in a row and just read all the words and not put them together as a sentence in your head, you know, because a sentence means something once you put it all together and there's a certain word that needs to be stressed or a different word or sometimes two words or whatever. (laughs) <laughs> that was one of the problems we ran into a lot of times. We're like, what is buffer? Is that, what's a bosun? And yeah, it's really hard when it doesn't mean anything to you as you read it. It's funny. And then the the other end of the complication was that Australian accent. This story is noteworthy because it inspired a new rule here at the Dune Steve. <laughs> Uh, do you want to share that rule with the listener? Uh, the new rule is what Rish says goes, I think. I'm fine with that rule. Yes, <laughs> let that be so. Amen. No, the new rule is from this point on, any Australian or English characters will be done by Big and Rish. Oh, my. And you might say, hey, what a selfish arse you are. But this what Rish uh, says goes. There you story go. required not one, not two, but like five or six genuine or semi-passable Australian accents. And do you know how difficult that was to get people who would do an Australian accent for free in a timely manner? Uh-huh. And that, that, again, is another reason, the timeliness thing, and have good sound quality and know what they're talking about. I don't know anybody who's Australian. Too right, Rish. And so we had to call on people. It's like, do you know anybody who's Australian? And if that person is Australian, can they act? And if they can (laughs) act, do they have a microphone? And if they have a microphone, would they be willing to do this for us? And if all of those things fell into place, woohoo, we've got one of the six that are necessary. And you know, that may be an exaggeration. It might've only been three, but then again, it might've been 10. That's another reason that this yeah, has taken a, so long. Yeah, it took a little longer than we expected for uh, various reasons, and that is definitely one of them. There was a lot of characters in this one. Uh, it's been a little easier for some of the other ones. Ernie Pine was uh, much easier to to get just because of the, you know, there, there tends to not be as many characters. Uh, At one point, and this was early on, I asked Rick, can we just do it with English accents? Uh, Was he Australia even part of the war? And he was like, oh, (laughs) you bastard. No, he he said, while the English accent may work for his his last story, or one of the last stories he sent us, all on St. Mark's Eve, uh, on St. Mac's Eve, he felt like this is an Australian story. The characters need to be Australian. And and you know what? I didn't know about his experience in the uh, the Minesweeper Corvette uh, uh, that he mentioned in his author's note. So I hope I told him way back then that, okay, if we do it in Australianese, uh, it's going to take a lot longer, but, uh, but we, 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 we will do as he said. And, uh, I don't know. We, we may have talked about it on the show. Our Australian accents aren't genuine, aren't really good. They aren't great. That's for sure. You're damn right. But <laughs> the, in the future, they're just going to have to do. And, and, you know, I, well, I appreciate how patient he was because, dude, September 2009. <laughs> the funny thing was, he even mentioned that 
in some of his correspondence with us, he said, you know, that, uh, that accent that Rish did, I listened to the one where he did the half Canadian, half Australian accent. No, nah, that sounded all right. I mean, you got to take the boats out, but he actually appreciated your accent. He thinks it's not terrible. Really? Well, I, I guess he's. I choose a, not to remember that. He's, I think, a little more forgiving than some others may may the be. The emperor is not as forgiving as I am. There you go. <laughs> the nerd uh, is strong in this one. So yeah, that's a that's a rule. I hope that everybody is okay with it. But uh, it, it, the rule is there for your protection as well as ours. And so... The rule is there because Rish says that's the rule. That's going to have to be because I'll, I rule. Um, I, 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 no, no, I'm sorry. O'Doyle rules. What? O'Doyle rules! O'Doyle rules! Who rules? O'Doyle rules! If you're not a mank, you're a wank. Oh. I, I, well, I, I don't know what you'd do without me frankly, on this show. I, Someday we may have to see. Yeah, you would uh, flail and flounder, that's my guess. Mm -hmm. and that's why I rule. Adorable. But um, the, the, the whole nautical thing, that, I don't think that's something we've done before on the show. I don't and think so either. Again, just between you and me, we'll never do it again. Never. Never. Again. Wait. <laughs> what, what? Never? Warning. Today's episode <laughs> contains singing. <laughs> no, never. But never. A minute ago. Will hardly ever. A minute ago, we, I said something loud, and I said, oh, shoot, Big, do you think I woke up your wife? And you're like, well, I don't know. Let's make sure. And he goes, never. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that was yeah. so mean. It's funny because going back to the point of the nautical stories, I, they're stories that I really kind of appreciate. For some reason, those kind of stories interest me a lot, like the... Horatio Hornblower stories or the Master and Commander stories. But uh, see, I have no clue what's going on. Right. A lot of I times read, it's the same way for me. I read, I think Master and Commander is the first of those, and I floundered like you would without me on the show. Mm -hmm. Just wondering what was going on and what these words meant. And I don't understand the traditions and I don't understand the rules of, and, and, and maritime law and all that stuff. So there's something fun about hearing words like mainsail, but they say mainsail and all that kind of crap. I just love to hear that for some reason. I don't know what it is, but like the strange pronunciation of every single word on a ship. Everything has a goofy name, and it's all not spelt the way it sounds. And I, gosh, I, you know, I've listened to several audiobooks of Horatio Hornblower and Master and Commander, etc. And uh, I feel so bad for those. I wonder how, you know, like we said, you know, how hard it was for us to read our way through this story. Imagine, instead of being a 5,000-word short story, it's a 100,000-word novel you have to read your way through. There, there's got to yes, be. I, I also expect he's not reading it at two thirty in the morning. <laughs> That's probably true. There's probably got to be like four producer types following along as he reads through, making sure. Wait, no, no, no. That one's that one's pronounced mainsail. Okay. And you know that was another bit of advice we gave in that. And I That's, believe oh, that's the mizzen mizzen mast mizzen mast. I'll listen to you. You actually <laughs> seem to know what the deuce you're talking about. Okay, so. Naval experience, naval tradition. Have you ever been on a boat? <laughs> we already finished our uh, vomit story episode, so I won't go into too much detail about my trip on a boat. I was in Boy Scouts growing up, so I did lots of small boat things on lakes. Hmm. I'm really good with a canoe, fairly good with a rowboat. I don't know how well I do on the sea, though. The ocean is a little different than a lake. There's much more movement going on with the water. Yeah, you don't tend to get tides in a little pond. Yeah, and you, there's a lot less seasickness involved. <laughs> when I was a kid, my dad, uh, somebody he knew was going to be doing this deep sea fishing trip. You know, you get on a boat somewhere near San Francisco or something and you head out into the ocean. A few miles was all it was and we would go fishing for a while. You know, we went out for the morning, came back in. Not a real big trip. Well, I, deep sea? That's what they call it. But if you're just a it's, couple miles off, is that deep? Well, it's deep. Oh, you mean deep down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, I guess, different kind of fish if you're deeper. I don't know what the deuce 
the deal was. <laughs> so we went out here and oh yeah, it was like a struggle the entire because this was not a big boat. I was not riding one of those gigantic carnival cruise ships or something like that. This was a fairly small boat, and so there was a lot of motion going on. And it was difficult to hold my lunch down, man. It was really rough. The whole time I'm sitting there just kind of struggling, my stomach was just really queasy. And I'm standing there at the edge of the boat, you know, with my little fishing pole stuck over the side. I don't think I caught a single thing, which always tends to make a fishing trip a little lamer but this guy is standing next to me while i'm sitting there fishing and all of a sudden he goes oh no oh this isn't good and then right over the side right next to me as i'm struggling to hold it down and i'm just like and that was all it took actually it wasn't i managed to fight the power oh and, uh, yeah, I made it through the whole trip without sending my lunch over the side, too. It may have been because I didn't eat any lunch. My dad had brought, like, some danishes or something along with us to eat. And I was just like, as much as I really would love to eat that right now, I, I can't do it. Because I know that it's not going to remain for long. So that's one of my on-boat experiences. I don't know if you've had some uh, experiences in nautical realms. Well, probably not nearly what you have because I'm a land lover. Ah, a lover. Um, but, you know, when I was in L.A., I, I was an extra and I got to do a, a couple oh, of, yeah, I that. of ocean things. And I'm trying to decide which one to share. I, I think we haven't really been talking about – to go back to what you were saying before about the mood of this piece, Uh huh. I got to work on a commercial that was shot aboard the Queen Mary. Oh, cool. And the Queen Mary is moored – Pretty much permanently down in Long Beach. Yeah, I've, I've actually been on the Queen Mary. We went uh, for a tour of it one time when I went down to visit L.A. Okay, well then, I was wrong. You will do fine without me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, sir. Tell me about your experience on the Queen Mary. Well, the I bells didn't... of Queen Mary. Stop it! It pales, I'm sure, compared to your experience. I mean, third base, probably, you got on, on the Queen Mary. Um, it was just a commercial, and you know, we had a little holding section where the extras are corralled until it's time for us to be used and then shunted back into the corral. And uh, we were supposed to stay there, but this was my first experience aboard this ship. And it was, it's a large cruise ship. Yeah, it's an old... Ship. Retired um, cruise ship. From years and years ago. And it is significant because it is reputed to be haunted. And everybody has interesting stories and they do conduct tours. Mm -hmm. And That's on, what I, went on. I believe, Halloween night or, or Halloween week, they will have parties there and, and you know, just uh, people come and uh, get spooked. And so I knew we were supposed to stay in holding. But as far as I knew, this was going to be my one chance to be on the Queen Mary and, and, and look around. And so, uh, you know, I, I slipped away figuring I could say that I was looking for the restroom if, you know, if anybody grabbed me and then slipped out of holding and, and, and went down the corridors. And this ship is immense. I don't know if you recall, but, you know, several levels, one of those where if you stand in the hall, the hall goes so far that you can't see the end of it. Although a lot of the lights were off. It's not like we were there for a tour. Right. So maybe maybe it wasn't as huge as my mind made it look. But standing in a hall where, you know, the lights go off a few feet and then there's, are plunged into darkness. And I think there's still like emergency lights or, or, or that sort of thing. Just to show you how far the aisle that it goes, I couldn't help but think about, you know, that it's like, okay, <laughs> how many people have seen something or experienced something or had some kind of brush with the supernatural or with their own imagination or the afterlife or wh wh whatever you want to say. And, and I was like, okay, this is my chance. So I, I stood there for a minute, just gazing into the darkness until, of course, my brain said, you know, you're going to see those two little twin girls from the fucking Shining. Mm. And then I was you're sure going to crap gonna... yourself. And so, <laughs> well, it'll be easier to explain you were looking for the bathroom, but uh, you'd best get back, son. Because, you know, it'll be time to sign your papers and they'll be like, you know what happened to this outfield kid? I don't know. It's like he disappeared during a, a commercial shoot and uh, just went AWOL. He didn't want his tiny little check, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, oh, but his car is still in the parking lot. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> I just disappear. It, uh, certainly... 
there had to be experiences like this, you know, of, 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 of people, a couple on their honeymoon and they go on the Queen Mary and the wife says, you know, she's going to go get some smelling salts or whatever after, you know, the, the horror, the shock of this guy's penis. Okay, here we go. She had to have something and, and she steps out into the hall, the aisle, the... Do they have a special name for halls on ships? Oh, I don't know. I just figured you being a, a, the a, mizzen, an expert. The mizzen at, poop deck. There you go. She steps <laughs> onto the mizzen poop deck and, you know, he's laying back and he's like, all right, I'm going to be ready for another go when she comes back. But she never comes back. You know, that sort of thing. You hear these stories all the – well, you hear the, these stories all the time. The, the Queen Mary has these kind of stories all the time. Uh huh. And those people just fell overboard, you know. <laughs> well, right. That that is very possible. Or it's just like, oh, the horrors of what this man did to me. I'm just going to jump off now. But it's an unexplained story, and you know, maybe all of them have banal answers to them, or you know, solutions to these stories. But because there's no solution, because there's no definitive answer, you can chalk it up to mm -hmm. they got her, or she's still on the ship wandering the halls looking for smelling salts or, or, or shivering at the side of this guy's erect member. See you later, uh, you everybody. Know, just like, oh my gosh, the, the ghost of the honeymooner or whatever it might be. And so, you know, a part of me wanted to have to the moon, Alice. an experience. That's right. Bang, <laughs> zoom. Part of me wanted to have an experience so that I could tell people. He's like, oh, I went in the Queen Mary and I saw... A cow. You went around the corner and you saw this cow there waiting Shoot, for you. Jink. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked down the aisle and I swear it was Soyel Moon Fry. Uh, Slo Soleil Moon Fry. And so she, was in, she was in her Punky Brewster outfit and she says, Have you seen Brandon? And, and you know, it's just like... Or at oh, least <laughs> Get me out of here, <laughs> He is found rocking in the aisles, singing to himself. Every time I, I turn, turn around, there's a ghost that of that girl again. <laughs> This is so lame. <laughs> uh, but see, because I didn't have any of those experiences, I don't have a cool story to tell. Darn it. And I wish I did. Well, you did crap yourself. That's good, right? Oh, no, wait, no, I didn't that... even do that. There was nothing. And then they um, found you wandering and this kid, and you don't get a check either. I was actually bringing back a lot of memories of what actually did happen as being an extra. <laughs> that, that sort of thing is fascinating to me, though, to, to go aboard that ship and to go on a tour and have somebody tell you. And, and, and this tour that you went on was scary. Story tour, or haunted Queen Mary tour, I'm, or just once upon a time, this was a fabulous cruise ship. I, 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 and it it's was still fabulous, like you, Mr. Anklevich. I think it was more of a tour tour than a scary tour tour. Well, then they wasted your time and theirs. To tell you the truth, it was a long time ago. I was a teenager, and I was at this point, I was just in the middle of the I'm too cool for everything kind of phase. If, that, if you never got out of that, phase. <laughs> if it were the present day, I probably would have been texting to somebody else the entire time and not have paid attention to anything. I remember more because right in the same place is also the Spruce Goose. Howard more, Hughes. I remember more aircraft, yeah. uh, experimental aircraft uh, hangar. Right. In case people don't know, okay. I mean, is Spruce Goose just, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio, never mind. I don't know how widely known it is. I just assumed everybody knew, but maybe they don't. But yeah, I remember more about the Spruce Goose and how cool that was than the Queen Mary. See, I'd not heard of the Queen Mary before, known that it was this kind of haunted ship or whatever. So, you know, one ship that I did get to tour that you might find to be interesting? The, the Millennium Falcon, anyone? Close. Oh. The USS Enterprise. Space, the final... Frontier, Mr. Anklevich, tell us about your experiences on the Starship Enterprise. No, it wasn't the Starship Enterprise. It was the, uh, I believe it's an aircraft carrier, the Enterprise. I'm not sure what kind of a ship it Can is. Can you show us where the nuclear vessels are? <laughs> but it was where the nuclear vessels are. Yes, we were in Alameda. And uh, we went and uh, went on a tour of the uh, USS Enterprise. That was an uh, interesting... Uh... Is it USS Enterprise or is it just US Enterprise? No, it's USS. That's... Really? I don't know what that stands for. It's like HMAS in this story. And I HMS. think it's United States ship is USS. That's probably what and it Her is. Her Majesty's ship, HMS. Yeah. Her Majesty's Australian ship. What is that? Is that maybe what HMAS? What was this one called? Beringi? Beringi. You know, the Beringi was the HMAS Beringi. Yeah, but, uh, HMASS. 
Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, the USS Enterprise, it was interesting because, yeah, we got to go on that ship and uh, take a look around. And I believe uh, it's a nuclear powered aircraft carrier this thing was and we got to walk around all inside of it and stuff it was pretty cool we didn't get to do too much or go too many places because this was an actual working ship and stuff like that and we weren't you know dangerous for you to go and get in the road of the forklift or the jet tire either way you could be injured but yeah it transparent was... aluminum oh that's right <laughs> that would have made us completely safe wouldn't it or at least it would have kept the whales in there it's times like this that I wish Kevin David Anderson still listened to the show. <laughs> and he wasn't way too good for us by now. You know, that, it, it makes me wonder, maybe he was always too good for us. <laughs> he probably was, yes. He was slumming for a very short time. Kind of the whole Angelina Jolie, Billy Bob Thornton thing. Yeah, so uh, one of my other nautical adventures is naughty nautical adventure <laughs> tales of rivalry Ew. <laughs> i don't know why that kind of stuff really i think is cool uh, maybe it's just because all kids love pirates or something like that that uh, nautical things turn out to be interesting or uh, i don't know what it is but probably not all kids love pirates i think it's all boys love pirates i don't know that girls are they all love Johnny Depp, but... Uh, oh, a pirate's life for me. Yeah, the uh, love for pirates in general is probably not as much. Maybe it has something to do with the raping and pillaging. Ah, oh, good times. That kind of turns women off to pirates a little bit. But yeah, you know, that, that stuff, it just really fascinates me for some reason. It's hard to read, but it fascinates me. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. Hey, one thing we wanted to uh, tell everybody about that uh, I think it just came out, at least recently. <laughs> Depends on when our episode hits, of course. But we got to do some lines. We got to do some lines on the Drabblecast of all places. Oh, see, I thought you were referring to the lines we did on that mirror in the bathroom. Oh, yeah, no, that was something else. College, folks. We uh, Norm sent us over a, an email saying, hey, do you guys want to do some lines? Because he just reached his 200th episode. That is significant. It's freaking amazing. Yes, when 200 episodes we reach <laughs> look as good, we will not. Hmm? That is for sure. That's a lot of episodes. We still haven't made it to 100. And I think we've been going only like a year or less than Norm, maybe more. But Well, he's weekly, man. Yeah, he kicks our butt every time. I have no idea time. how he manages that. It's amazing. But yeah, he had us on there. He's doing an, a big a production of an Asimov story. Itzak Asimov, I believe it's pronounced. Oh, really? I didn't know that. You learn something new every time you talk to Rish. That's right. And dolphins are just gay sharks. Really? I didn't know that either. Wow. Okay. Yeah, if you want to swing over there and check that out, you can give a listen and hear uh, Rish and I argue about what will happen when the stars run out. Yeah, Norm's stuff is always really well done, well put together, uh, timely and prompt. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he's got a lot of fun stuff prepared for his 200th F, his 200th birth his 200th episode. I wanted to say 200th anniversary, 200th <laughs> birthday. Uh, what what was the name of that Asimov story? The story is called The Last Question, I believe. I'll take the last question for 200, Alex. Catherine Deneuve, Ursula Andress, and Charo twice. Uh, it's called The Last Question. It's a fairly well-known Asimov story, I believe. It's a, it's a classic. It's a favorite. Hence, I've never heard of it. <laughs> I've heard Asimov himself read it. How about that? I listened to an audiobook. But... And he's got that great like New York-sounding uh, accent going... Good stuff. Okay, hey, that's over at drabblecast.org. Org! Yeah, check it out. Thanks, Norm. Someday he'll be on our 92nd episode. Yeah, that would be cool. Wait. I have looked into the past and had a vision <laughs> of what will be. Wow. Impressive. All right, folks. Okay, check it out. Is that it? Have we come to the end? This is the end. My only friend. The end. The end. I 
I don't know that I have anything more I want to talk about. Uh, you? Oh, we've probably reached the end. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. You know, he had... Uh, I'm sorry, were you No, done? no, I was saying that I have nothing to say, so... Okay, well, then, then we'll end on this. Uh, he mentioned that somebody's making a film version uh-huh. of one of his stories, and right, that he right. had in written his, a part short? for himself, a cameo for himself. Right, I don't know that it's so much a part. Yeah, a cameo is a little different than a part. I think he's just in the background. <laughs> Yes, he, he is apparently the writer that in the future, his work inspires so many people. It brings about a new age of enlightenment. <laughs> and he casts himself in this role. And people wonder why, why, why there was a backlash. <laughs> in case you're wondering, he's referring to M. Night Shyamalan. In Last Airbender, yes. Yes. Um, I just, you and I, we didn't have a long time together in college as friends. I met you, I believe, in the middle of my junior year. Mm -hmm. And so we had like about a year and a half, I think, uh, Mm -hmm. that we were friends. Am I... Am I wrong? Was it the beginning of my junior year kind of thing? I don't remember exactly, but it sounds about right. Or maybe I met you at the very beginning of my junior year, but we didn't become friends until midway through or toward the end. So so I had about a year there where you and I hung out and stuff, and uh, we would try and do a lot of student films, and and my reach was infinitely further than my (laughs) grasp. Um, your so, eyes were bigger than your stomach. That's right. Or my genitals. Keep those cards and, and letters coming, so, folks. And I so many times had an idea for, oh, let's get together and we're going to do this and we're going to shoot something. And then it didn't happen because it requires a bunch of people. Filmmaking is this huge collaborative it process and it is. takes way more people than you ever would think. Well, maybe not. It takes a lot of people, but it always takes way more time than you ever would think. <laughs> I mean, even little things where we came up with something. I was like, oh, we can shoot that in an hour. Six hours later, you're still working on it. It's like, oh, why? Why did I? (laughs) And why did I do this? Somebody kill me now. One of the projects that I I get probably the first project that I wrote that you and I did. Did we even work on it together? Yeah, we were. You and I first met on on a set, but I was (laughs) a. I was an idea guy, and a bunch of you were in a class. What was the class? It was film production, a film production class. And? 215, uh, I believe, was the number. Okay, that that (laughs) means nothing to me. Uh, Basically, 666, 69, and 13 are the only numbers that mean anything to me. Oh, okay. But but we all got together, and a friend of ours, our mutual friend that that we sometimes talk about but never say his name because if you say it three times, (laughs) he said, oh, this guy, Outfield, he wants to be a writer. Uh, he's got a lot of really cool ideas. And so we sat down together and they said, well, we'll just pitch us some ideas. I think it's sort of like that. And I said, oh, I've got a notebook where I've jotted down a bunch of ideas. And these are some of the ones I've come up with recently. And, you know, some of them were really, really fleshed out. And a couple of them were just like one sentence kind of things. And, and, and a couple were just the punchlines to a joke that somebody uh-huh. I could use. And for some reason, you guys all really dug one of these punchlines, one of these <laughs> yeah, jokes. The one that was a punchline to a joke, yeah, I was going like, to say. Oh, no, no, tell us more about that one. And I was like, no, that's that's it. It's just a silly joke. It's a play on words, really. And, and they're like, no, 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 that, that, that's the one we're going to do. Yeah, we went And for I it. said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? What does this consist of? And they're like, okay, well, we've got to shoot it as the final project of our film production class. And, and you know, maybe this was never explained to me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but he's like, well, we're really going to shoot this thing. And we're, you know, we're going to go If I remember out, right, we it. said, give us a five minute script because it has to be five minutes. And you came back with a 15 minute script and said, here you go, guys. <laughs> we're like, oh, we're in trouble. Because we actually shot this one on film. I know that you children out there wouldn't remember. We don't know what this thing is that we're speaking of. But film, it, it didn't just mean a movie. This was an actual thing that you would put in the camera and you shine light through it and it would remember what the the light looked like. It recorded images on it. It um, seems so primitive now. It really it does. It was very, very costly and we were just thinking, oh crap, we're in trouble. So you guys, well not you, but one of the, the members of the crew just hacked the hell out of this <laughs> script. And that really, really bothered me. It, it hurt me for a long time. But see, I didn't understand. Nobody had explained that I never heard five minutes. I never heard five pages or yeah. anything like that. No, they just <laughs> said, we like this idea. And so I put some time and work into it. And yeah, it's a, 
I'm sure I burned some bridges there, <laughs> but I don't give a shit. I still friggin' hate all of you for it, <laughs> uh, except Ian. Especially me. But but just in developing it, gosh, this is such an overblown story for it a is. silly, weak yeah. punchline. But in the, the writing of this thing, I thought, well, I'm an actor, and I'm sure as hell going to be required to be on the set in case they need rewrites and stuff because this is how naive I was in those days. It's like they're going to want me to help out in every area of the production. So why not write a part for myself? And like, what what is the juiciest part I could write for myself? Do you recall what that part was? Yeah, I do. I remember it well. I cast the woman that you sold your soul for and I cast her well. His The part he came up with was this guy who sells his soul to be able to be... Uh, With the girl he loves. Awesome, basically. He wants to be cool. He wants to get chicks. He wants to not be a loser. And yeah, so he casts himself as that person. And uh, even though somebody tries to talk him out of selling his soul, he's like, are you kidding? I'm doing this. And he does this. And then we go back to a scene later where he's there and... <laughs> He's sitting on the couch with this absolutely gorgeous woman. And she's wearing this freaking red sequined like prom dress watching TV with him on the couch. And Rish says, wow, I wish I was the greatest American hero. <laughs> I believe that was an ad-libbed line. Yeah. yeah. And she says, well, you're the hero to me or something i don't remember what she said in return and then this make absolutely gorgeous woman is required as an actress to make out with rish and we had to shoot that a couple times if i remember right yeah the lighting wasn't quite yeah it right. was a little off the angle the, uh, <laughs> I, I was slow on oh. my delivery but that may be the only time in history where the writer has come out on top. Ah, oh, uh, get what you're going uh, there. Oh. I don't know that I meant it that way. <laughs> uh, but that was really fun. And I course, know that... Of course, you know, in that scene, the deal with the devil, the contract does get ripped up. And then she snaps to and realize what's going on. And you do get a good slap in the face as part of that whole scene. So I get, you've probably forgotten about that part in the uh, haze of the good earlier part of the scene. No, no, I remember that because <laughs> for some reason she really sold the makeout thing, more so than she needed to. I think we discussed this afterward because you came up to me and you were like, I cast this chick, how'd I do? And I was like, feel this. That's how well you did. And by the way, I did not feel it. Just just to make sure anybody might be confused. I did not accept the invitation. You're fooling nobody. He's like, how did I do or whatever? And, and I was just like, dude, she she totally made out with me. She didn't even have to. I, like once she was turned away from the camera, she could have been, you know, just pretending to gag or rolling her eyes. But she, oh, and then when it came time for the slap, oh, she sold that she too. Sold she did not well. pull or punch or any of that stuff. But, but you know, it was fine. It was the price I paid. Uh, Gosh, it was so weird because for a brief moment, I think I got to experience what your life <laughs> has been like because all the guys in there were like, wow. That lucky bastard. Everybody on the set was so... Have you ever had so many people jealous of you? Holy crap. And the funny thing was, I actually tried to go out with this chick later. I called her up and I, oh, I tried so hard to get a date with this chick. But the worst possible thing could have happened, apparently... I, wait, I turned her off men forever? <laughs> no, what turns out is she is, was roommates with this girl that I had in another class of mine that I used to walk oh, from one class to the to other. The curb. And not that I kicked to the curb, but this chick just had like a crush on me. And because of that, this other girl that was her friend wouldn't go out with me just because, you know, it would destroy her friend's heart. It would break her heart for her good friend to steal the guy away from her, which was such a bummer because this girl that was in the class with me was not... There was never, ever, ever going to be anything between us. We weren't going to go out. We weren't going to do anything. But gosh, that other chick was so hot and I wanted so badly to go out with her. And it did not ever happen because of that uh, strange quirk of fate. So if it weren't for the roommate, things could be very different. Uh, I don't know. Probably not. But uh, I might have also at least made out with that chick. I could tell my story. We would have something in common. <laughs> You know, one time I made out with this girl that later married uh, another friend of mine. I hope it wasn't Ian. Oh, my god! It gosh. wasn't, no. Weird for that to happen. 
Sorry. Um. Yeah. So there's your your cameo in your movie, hum. Oh yeah. I don't know that that is applicable. It's a fun yeah. story though. That's all that matters. If you're gonna write something for yourself. Yeah, make it a good go for a good it. part. And that's difficult when it becomes like real professional film and all that stuff. Because, dude, M. Night had no business in <laughs> any of those parts. <sighs> it doesn't matter that we're bringing that up again. But someday I will tell you of the next time that sort of thing happened uh, and two mixed results ah, uh, yes. in, in an actual film. The yeah. one script I've written that has been made. Uh, sort of fair to say, I don't know. The one professional, unprofessional writing gig <laughs> that uh, actually went into production. Yeah, yeah. That's a, wasn't wasn't that when you made out with a Muppet? There was a Muppet involved, right? Is a. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. That's our show for today. Yes, appreciate you listening all the way through. And you know, thank you to Rick Kennett for his continued patience. That's unmatched patience. And. Uh, to Marshall Latham. And talking about patience. <laughs> the work that it must have... Uh, I, I see, I just... I wouldn't have wanted to edit this story, and you wouldn't have either. And he, as far as I know, volunteered for it. This was his first story. He actually... I mean, the other one that came out a few weeks ago, he produced after getting most of the way through this story, and he kind of got stalled and had to wait for a few lines to come in. And so this was the first one that he ever did, and I think he did a great job. Someday this will be the Marshall Steve podcast but he's just amazing he he he's, he owns this show the way he's working these days he's got another one coming folks so get ready you kidding he's, me he's already working on his third show so he is? that's right it's got an epic story behind it even more epic than the story behind this show so get ready okay well i've been rich outfield and i'm big Anklovich. good day mate cheery eye <laughs> do they say that in australia i don't uh, really yeah. know i don't know Crikey! There you go. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please donate, folks. It'll help us pay our authors. And isn't that what it's all about? The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. They got the queen on their money. They're British. There you go. Who is incredibly handsome, has his own podcast, and will die unloved and alone. Rish Outfield, as viewed by Stevie Wonder. Because he's blind. Don't you get it? Take two. He turned again as the bridge ladder rattled. I'll fix that. He turned again as the bridge rattle laddered. <laughs> thought you were going to fix it. Good day, mate. Good day, y'all. Wow, what the hell was that, Bruce? I'm Lieutenant... Le I'm sorry, I'm Lieutenant Buffer. <laughs> Freed the Buffer? I'm Lieutenant Rish Outfield. And I'm Cap <laughs> Captain Big Anklovich. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me start over. Have we started again? Have we st oh. oh, sorry. That was your line. <laughs> right, let, let me start over. The destroyer sounded her siren. I'm sorry. Can you make it slightly bigger? Sure. That's what she said. <laughs> that ain't funny, ma'am. But it's true. Oh, now can you make it smaller? Thank you. No, I've gone too far. I always go too far. Have you noticed that? I can't leave well enough alone. Is that how you're going to do it? Sure, why not? But aren't these all Aussies? Yeah. Oh, that's an Aussie line. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> you're going to say a naughty word here, aren't you? No, no, no. That's fine. But, uh, okay, so... No, I think you're going to say a naughty word. Read on, sir. No, I want you to at least say what's it sound like again. I did. What's it sound like? <laughs> what? The sea people there had already pressed their ears. The men of the ocean there had already pressed their ears. All right, I'll say it. Forgive me, mother. The seamen there had already pressed their ears against the steel, hearing only their own blood. Ass a dick. <laughs> Ass dick. Well, you that's, must be joking. That's two dirty words, isn't it? Right in one. I'm going to start calling you Ass dick.
Well, you'd be pronouncing it wrong. It's ass dick. Noun, British sonar. Cool. Anti-submarine detection investigation committee. It is ass dick. With that is friggin' rad. <laughs> go. Oh, don't go. Except for the four-inch gun, which was smashed to uselessness, Beringi's only weapon was a 40 millimeter Beaufort's anti-aircraft gun on the boat decked aft. <laughs> Why is this so hard for me to read? Because it's all freaking lingo and... Beringi's only weapon was a 40 millimeter Beaufort's anti-aircraft gun on the boat decked aft. Just deck, not decked. Damnation. That and two 20 millimeters... That and two... That and two 20-millimeter machine guns mounted one either bridge wing. Line? <laughs> that and two 20-millimeter machine guns mounted one either bridge wing. Okay. The four-inch, he decided, could be... I'll take it from here, soldier. The four-inch, he decided, could be... He jerked about, startled by a hollow... He sudden. jerked about his four-inch. <laughs> I wish it was four-inch. Steam pressure's building satisfactorily. What the Christ? Steam pressure's building satisfactorily, said engineer the above. <laughs> wow, it's getting late or what? And no amount of winding, tinkering, or swearing would make them work. God, oh, crikey, I can't get this bloody clock to work. Flibbledy jibbledy. And if things got too rough, there was always the destroyer's motorboat slung in Beringi's port side davits. It was davits, it was right? Davits, yeah. And if things got too rough, there was always the destroyer's motorboat. <laughs> I tried to obey, but it is difficult. He stepped out onto the board bridge swing. <laughs> what? Wouldn't you want to have a swing on there? I mean, come on. He stepped out onto the port bridge wing. X-wing. I'm just going to change it to that. Okay. Not enough, not enough Star Wars references. He stepped out Wait, onto... Wait, let me go. i got a bad feeling about this, Captain. There. Now we've got an extra Star Wars reference for you. Someday we're going to do that. We're going to have a contest. He stepped out onto the port... The porch is really what it was. It just... Just before the 10 o'clock change of watch... Just before the 10 o'clock change of watch, Dixon went out again onto the bridge wing. <laughs> it shouldn't be hard. Is it not a hard story? I'm just. It is. Is it me? A, a nautical stories are always hard because they got so much lingo. It, it might as well be a polka story because everything. I mean, you haven't had to say a lot of words like gunnel. And things like that, at least. You haven't had that where I've heard tons of podcasts where they're like, and the gunwale came over. And you're like, dude, no, come on, not gunwale. Is it spelled gunwale? It is. And you're supposed to say gunnel? You say gunnel. There's all sorts of words like that in freaking nautical. It's just like lieutenant, which we have to now go back and fix. It's just the way those freaking stories. Can you imagine having to be the guy that does the audio book of like Master and Commander or... Uh, Horatio Hornblower or something where you're just saying that for 300 pages instead of 10. Yeah, but whatever he's being paid, it's more than we're being paid. You're being so paid you're... by the hour. Come on. Paravanes, Bofas, Bifa, Bofa. Did you hear they cast all those bastards? I didn't, and I could care less. Really? They are the same character, so. But I was the only person that had no respect. But you. Paravane. After all he's done for you. None of you would be alive if it went J.R.R. Tolkien. He turned again as the bridge ladder rattled. I'll fix that. He turned again as the bridge rattle laddered. <laughs> I thought you were going to fix it. <laughs> See, what's cool is you've got a bell on the doorknob. So if someone were turning the doorknob, that could be making that sound. Huh? Oh. Huh? <clears throat> Not so horny now, are you? Late that cat knocks down your boner, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That is funny stuff. 
Beg your pardon, sir? I don't think that's too ca- cartoony a voice. You do him. Beg your pardon, sir. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> 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 oh, you want me to know Bruce? <laughs> Mind if I call you Bruce to keep it straight? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Beg your pardon, sir. Dixon almost jumped. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> uh, that's funny. What's a buffer, do you think? A boofer? A wait, a what? <laughs> what? A boofer, a boofer. All right. Um, buffer. Beg your pardon, sir? Dixon almost jumped, but it was only Chief Boson's mate, Frood, the buffer, standing beside him in the gathering. <laughs> <laughs> what? I didn't know nothing. I'm sorry. That, that's just a bunch of nonsense <laughs> words there that made me laugh. <laughs> the Chief Boson's mate, Frood, the buffer. <laughs> It was only Chalukang for Sinka Kitchkina. Look at it. Standing beside him in there. I was like, wait, what? That wasn't English. That was gibberish. Stop. Fruid the Buffer. What is Fruid? Is that his name? I, I think his chief bosun's name, Fruid. Fruid kind of name is Fruid. We'll change it to Smith. Dixon almost jumped. But it was only Chief Boson's mate, Fruid, the Buffer, standing beside him in the gathering. <laughs> what? I think we're going to have to pause here for a minute. I can't okay. stop. Oh, why would you want to? Oh, something about it just makes me think of Thomas the Train. <laughs> Looks like a destroyer, sir. Even as he focused, Dixon was weighing up the chances of it being Japanese. Turning Japanese? Oh, yes, I'm turning Japanese. I, I really, really think, think so. so. Dun, 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 dun. Say that one more time. I'm turning Japanese. I think I'm turning Japanese. I really think so. Not that. Damn queer, said the captain when Dixon told him of their continuing miracle of good weather. Hey, none of those kind of slurs. Darn it. What do you think this is? Oh, so he was calling you a damn queer. <laughs> I see. I didn't even make that connection. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Sorry. Wouldn't they say poofta? She was partly dismantled and tethered to a boy in a harbor... Ooh. Really? Buoy. I'm never going to say buoy. I'm sorry. Really? You say boy? Yeah. Sorry. But it's not a boy. It's a buoy. A boy is like a, a young man. A buoy is those things that float out in the water. You'd really like to have a young man right now, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, I'd like you to say buoy instead of boy. I can't. All right. Whatever you say. I, I could say Bowie knife or David Bowie. Hold on. I'm going to see what it says. Und- oh, whoops. Wrong one. Paravanes. I'll say paravanes. How's that? Okay. <laughs> that was weird. He actually gave me both. He went buoy or boy. Did he really? <laughs> yeah. So it's it means something to you to say buoy? Well, buoy is how I say it, but you can I guess if you say boy, that so does dictionary.com, so do it. Just to me, boy is a young man, whereas buoy is something else. So that's all. You need to speak to a counselor. I guess I do. She was partly dismantled and tethered to a bull. Bo- bo- You've got me paranoid, man. I say it how you say it. It's Bob Saget. <laughs> Saget's fallen on harder times these days. Imagine having Saget as your last name. Just the real was pummeling. There's that contest, I guess, every year now for the Super Bowl commercial. Doritos does a contest and they have just random anybody creates commercials for Doritos. And then the top vote winning commercial gets shown on the actual Super Bowl. So they interviewed the folks today on the morning show. They interviewed the folks that did that. And (laughs) the woman, I don't remember what her first name was, but her last name, (laughs) it was... Ork Ork balls. balls. (laughs) Oh, no. But, yeah, luckily she's getting married to some guy whose last name is Burningham, so. Burning testes. Even even if that guy is, like, trailer trash piece of crap, she's still marrying up. (laughs) I hope you're recording, sir. Are you? I am. Okay, well, we've got some content for the episode. Thank Buddha. 
Nicole edited did no, it? she rounded up all uh, the Ah, Diddlin' Boyd. Oh, we've got Diddlin' Boyd on the show today. Diddlin', it's Dylan. Oh, Diddlin' Boyd. How's it feel to be Diddlin' again? Oh, I know what it is. Hold on a sec. Skipping <laughs> Why? You should have used a prophylactic. What? Well, what is it? It's the CD player, plain song, and then it's totally stuck. It's uh-huh. She did that last night, the entire night. She slept the whole night through without doing that. Imagine how awful your sleep would be. How like insane you would wake up. <laughs> insane. <laughs> I don't know how she can live through it. She wakes up the next morning. It's like, daddy, 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 daddy. You're like, stop that. Why are you doing that? I don't know, no, 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 no. <laughs> and pause. Hello, we're back. Good day, Bruce. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Dean, Steve. Wait, we haven't even introduced the story in author's note and all this. Oh, you're right. We better go back. I thought we was done with that crap. Rish Outfield was our narrator. Also, he was the captain of the ship. Did the captain have a name? I can't remember if he had a name. I'm sure I don't know. Captain's name was Fruit the Buffet. Okay, I don't know. Wait, wait, what? Let me <laughs> let me start that over. If a ship can have a soul, why can't she sell that soul? Okay, start over. You kidding? I, I You know how difficult it is for a guy as fat as me to squat? Somebody's going to the bathroom, I think. All right. Sorry, Sheila. Bells of St. Mary's, what uh, was it called? Uh, Seas King- of Castle Hill. No. <sighs> it was something about bells. Or- on St. Andrew's Eve. It's something like that. All, all on St. Max. Mark's Eve? All on St. Max Eve. Hello, child. What are you doing out here still? Go to bed. You gotta get to sleep, bucko, or else you're gonna be tired again tomorrow. Just k- get back to sleep. And close your door when you go in there, too, because that'll help you stay asleep instead of hearing us yell. This kid was up till like four last night. Really? Yeah, he like found the bottle of Mountain Dew and just Woo-hoo! went off on it. It is all on St. Mark's Eve. Okay. So let me go again. How dare you? I dare much. How dare you, sir? <clears throat> I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. Let my armies be the rocks and the trees and Mary Robinette Cole. What other things do they do in special episodes sometimes? Arnold learns about drugs. So Dudley is molested by the bicycle shop owner. Right, right on. Gosh, my mic is really bad. Okay, so what are we fighting about? I think about the the ship making the deal with the devil that has left us here. That that killed us but left her to survive. So I'd be saying, how could you have done such a... Th-? But I have to do that and an Australian accent. How could you have left us like this? I didn't leave anyone. You left us before. You left us for dead. No, you're all still here. No one's been left. You sent us all to the bottom of the ocean. Okay, don't take that tone with me. You did it. It was all you. Hey, it was the the, the, the heat of the moment. Tell you me murdered what my us. heart meant. You murdered us all. I murdered no one. You it murdered us shit. all with the bottom of the ocean. What was I supposed to do? I'm still trapped in that damn hold with a, with a hammer in me hand. No, I didn't sign up for the service. You did. You volunteered. It's your own bloody You were fault. made for the service and you turned your back on us. Made a deal with the devil. Ye sack. Now, now you're really, really <laughs> hurting me. Get stuffed. All right, stop it. <laughs> Should we, we, I guess we've probably got to go on a little longer. You wanted 30 seconds. Oh, I can't believe you did that to us. Would you stop You are the worst me? ship ever. Wait, wait, I'm not a ship. You're, you're a ship. You're, you're a, a ship. ship. You're a piece you're, of ship, at least. Hey, that's not funny at all. Puns are the lowest form of humor. <laughs> you can die. I, I wish have... you could die. Jealous. Piece of freaking steel. That's all you are. And you destroyed us all. Look at this bloody good weather. 
weird good weather keeps going on because of your deal with the devil, you crappy ship. Look, it was the price I was willing to pay. I I'm know. still here and you're gone. So why That's don't you shut I'm up about it? Leave off. me in peace. I'll never I've... leave you in peace. Eternity is a long hold bloody you time. forever. And then I'll take you down to hell with me. You think I'm not in hell already? Well, there's the static. I guess we're done. Thank you. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good 